Greetings all. I have come to Detroit, Michigan. Well, technically the town of Warren, the home of the Great Tank Factory. Does that even still exist? The big building? It's uh, moved off in the 90s. They closed down the tank factory and moved down to Lima, Ohio for the JSC. But, but the physical building itself, did they, shut, did they knock it down? I believe it still exists, like back behind the take home area. Okay, I gotta go check that out. But anyway, we're not here to talk about the storied history of the Detroit tank arsenal. We're here to look at some of the new toys that the US Army will be feeling shortly. And I am standing in front of an Amp V with Lieutenant Earl Costa, who is the product manager of the vehicle. What does the product manager do anyway? I'm responsible for the cost schedule and performance for the vehicle, so whether it's meeting its uh, performance requirements, so I think speed for mobility, or the cost so the vehicle is supposed to operate within a certain, or the program is supposed to really be within a certain cost for the Army to do the research and development and then get into production and fielding phase, and then the schedule to make sure we're meeting all of our required gates to be able to get to first unit equipped. Okay, so the story of the AMP V, which is not, I mean, it's not going to be fielded as AMP V, is it? Or it's already being fielded in Fort Stewart? It'll be starting to field in the beginning of 2023, and it's still the armored multi purpose vehicle, still called AMP V. Will it get a real name? Maybe in the sometime Brad, future. Bradley Jr. Or something like that? It's I'm, not going to be I mean, Bradley this Jr. This looks a hell of a Bradley to me. Okay. There's some differences. All right, so let's start way back with the requirements. So initially, uh, the world was created, the M113 was created, and God said this is good. Yes. And the M113 has been in U.S. service for 60-something years now. For a long time. 1980 rolls around, 1982, give or take. A new infantry fighting vehicle is put forward to replace the M113. But the M113 soldiers on. Why did we never replace it before? The Army chose to maintain the 113 in the, in the inventory as the, filling the role for the mortar carrier as well as for the medical evac mission that they had on the ground and then for their mission command for their mobile platforms and then they were focused on the tank and the Bradley at those times. So why, why is it time to replace the M113 now? At this point the uh, the 113 is not, yeah, I mean, if you look at the mobility and severability aspects of the 113 compared to the other modernized vehicles in the Army Brigade, it doesn't meet the, it doesn't have those um, performance attributes to it. And then as well as when you start looking at how we've been operating over the last, um, I don't know, decade or more with uh, in Iraq, the 113 just sat on the fobs because they didn't have the force protection to be able to be able to move soldiers off the FOB or to be able to be used in any of the convoy aspects that were going on in Iraq. So now we have a, a vehicle that's um, incredibly more survivable than the 113 as well as uh, speed-wise it can keep up with the Bradley and the Abrams, the Paladin, so it can keep up and keep pace with the formations as they move on the battlefield. Okay. So this is, the, the Army's basically going to a, basically either an Abrams platform for the tank, for the ABV, for the jab, or a Bradley platform for the Bradley, the, the, the MLRS, the Paladin, and now this one, correct? Yep. That's correct. So, all right, so it simplifies a lot of our logistics. Yes. How different is, it, other than the fact that it has a different hole and no turret, how different is this from, let's say, my Bradley? From your Bradley, so the, a lot of the mobility aspects are still pretty common between Bradley as well as the Paladin. So the engine, the Cummins engine is the same. You reuse a lot of the track, the suspension, the road arms, a lot of that um, stayed the same as well. So there is a lot of commonality when you look at the mobility aspects between those three platforms, which is a huge uh, logistics. Uh, you're saving a lot of logistics burden from the soldiers because they can now just order the same items to be able to go on three different platforms. So if you get a license for an AMP, do you also have a license for a Bradley and vice versa? There's different aspects. So each unit uh, will they'll have their own driver training program. They'll be set up specifically for the different vehicles that they'll be licensed on because there's different characteristics as you're driving an AMP or a Bradley or even a Paladin. And you'd start looking at like Paladin or has the, their big gun tube on the front and then being able to maneuver the vehicle so you don't impact the gun tube or if you're driving the AMP, you don't have to worry about a gun tube per se. Okay, so as we're going around this vehicle, which variant have we got here? We have the Mission Command variant. Uh, so this replaces the 577. 
Yes, and the 1068, and then as I mentioned, this is a family of vehicles, so the other four variants, so five variants total, so Mission Command, then we have a mortar carrier, which replaces the 1064, so the M1061064. Then we have the medical evac uh, variant, a medical treatment variant. So the difference between those is medical evac would be used for like your ground evac for going forward and then bringing soldiers back to the rear to receive um, aid. The medical treatment would be where they would, the unit would set up like their aid station, so then you'd have a big uh, tent that'd be set up behind it, and that's where your, your PA, so your physician assistant, would be set up to be able to do higher level care on soldiers. So the one is like, it's just not, nothing but litters and maybe an aid man, and the other one, it's got a lot more surgical equipment in it. Yes, yes, that's correct. And then, so the mission command, the medical treatment, medical evac, the mortar carrier, and then General purpose. General purpose, thank you. It's always a good fallback answer. <laughs> so then the general purpose would be more geared towards like your first sergeant, so running the, like the supplies and the log packs, so being able to move forward. Uh, it has seating for uh, like four soldiers in the back, as well as being able to haul supplies, so then like food and ammo and stuff like that around for to support the, the command elements. So I'm kind of curious about the mortar track. Uh, so the, the 1064 is basically still an old-fashioned manual mortar in the back of the 113. Does the Amp V mortar carry have computers, fire control systems for the mortar, all that sort of good stuff, or is it still just a good old-fashioned 120 mortar without the base? So it's they use the same mortar system, um, and then the the mortar ballistic computer that the units have now, it, they bring those into the into the vehicle on there able to be set up so then they're hooked up to a display and everything so they can be used. But a lot of the mortar system stuff has remained the same. We're just providing the new vehicle to house all that. All right. And so you can dismount it if you really wanted to. Yep. There's a place on the side of the vehicle where they have the base plate for the 120 so they'd be able to actually like do dismounted operations if they really wanted to. All right. So I'm going to assume that the front of the vehicle is pretty much the same across the entire family. Yes. It's pretty close. More or less. All right. So as I'm looking around, some very <coughs> beefy lifting eyes or pillows? Both. Both uh, lifting eyes and then recovery as well. Okay. Uh, the track is dual pin. Uh, nothing new about the headlights. What are, what are these for? Those are, so we have the um, wire guards that go over the top of the vehicle. So, like you're, if you're driving in a, in a uh, a city, and then you have all the power lines and stuff, so it's to help the lines go up and over the vehicle. That's a good idea. I'm, I'm, I've got one car around my neck and just driving around in the M1. That, that was a life changing moment. Yep. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're going slowly enough, I can still pull it out. Oh, okay, we've got a few more lifting eyes. Wire cutter? Yes. Oh, you got one on the other side as well? Yep. Okay. Smoke grenade launchers at the front, so these look like your standard, what is it, 256, 258? Yes. If I recall. Somebody's gonna nitpick me, it happens. <coughs> it's all the smoke grenade launchers. Oh. Can you, can you fit your array on it? I presume you can. The reactive tiles? Yes. yes. Yeah. And a really, really bright spotlight. So if, think if you're uh, driving, if the vehicle's in the city and then you have crowds and you're trying to disperse the crowds, so then like a light and speaker. So you'd have a non lethal means to deter. If, as if a 40, what is that, 35 tons? 35, 40 tons. As if that doesn't deter people? I'm assuming I'm looking at housing for a night vision camera or something. For your, uh, your driver's, um, your DV wide, so your driver's vision. So you go down and you get the night vision for the driver. Right, and that's in the infrared, uh, a FLIR, not a, an image, image intensifier, right? Yep. Back in the day, I'll get whited out by headlights on the battlefield. <laughs> Who thought that I'd have headlights on the battlefield? Go we'll for a tiff as a result, no matter. Uh, okay, so... Oh, that's what I'm looking at here. The NATO slave adapter. Oh, so you don't have to drag the cable into the driver's compartment anymore. Yep. A little extra armor on the final drives, I see. 
with replaceable trackpads here. Do you get to carry the, the X browsers for ice? I presume you got ice and you've tested it in the cold and misery here in Detroit. Uh, they did the cold weather testing up at the Cold Regis Test Center, so at Fort Greeley, Alaska. That sounds cold. <laughs> <clears throat> and I presume desert testing in Yuma then? Yes, and then some testing at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. So. so what testing do you do here? For here, we have the um, GVSC, so the ground vehicle. Um, they're the. This is the old Tardec. The old, the old version of Tardec. So if we do uh, some engineering work with them as well as with the Prime, so BAE. So we, if we have like a smaller type of engineering project we want them to look at, so we can get an initial concept or design, then we can have they have a vehicle that they'll be able to have CAD drawings as well as the vehicle they start doing some some mock fit ups for other changes that we want to do for the future of the vehicle. So I'm not used to seeing antennae on the front of the vehicle. Is that because there's just so many antennae in the command variant or do they all have the antenna mounts in the front? No, I think this this is just for the, the command variant. How many Because so, you have four radios for the command variant. So how many people fit in the command variant? The, the driver, you have a vehicle commander, and then um, depending on your staff section, you can fit three more people on the back. And is it designed for command on the move, or do you have to stop you know, coming back to back with four vehicles to set up a little CP? It's designed for both. So command on the move, so all the, all the digital command post op systems are built into the vehicle. And then we also have the old, uh, well, new versions of the old sick up tents that would that connect to the back of the vehicle, so then you can set up your traditional huge command post where you have all the vehicles back in, set up all the connecting tents for all your staff sections. All right, so I've just taken my CPC e-course. Would there be a CPC laptop in there? And if so, would that be basically, would that work wirelessly, or would I have to stop and hook up network connectors? Still? So they, a lot of that stuff is through the, uh, what we have is JBCP now, so the Joint Battle um, Command Platform. <coughs> so there's, <coughs> they do the planning off of that, as well as the current operation tracking, and, and then the, like your planner could be in there with a separate um, workstation that's not tied into the system where they can start working on future plans as well. So like your assistant S3 who might be doing looking at future stuff while your S3 is looking at the current operation side. So as well. this would go as high, it would basically be at uh, the same brigade and battalion that you wouldn't expect to see these in a division headquarters? Right now the plan is for brigade and battalion level for like the mission commands. And then when you start looking at like your field artillery units, you have within the battery, you have two fire direction centers, so one for each platoon. They would get a mission command as well. It has a different role to fit the specific fire direction center need. OK, so before we uh, leave the front of the vehicle, uh, I'll just note the PC's cupola, I guess, which is fairly heavily armored. Now, is that going to be standard, or is that, shall we say, like the Tusk modification to this vehicle? No, that'll be standard for uh, all five variants. They'll each get the, the uh, commander's weapon station, which then we'll be able to... They'll have the, the weapon mounts, so it can take whichever weapon system that the unit would be m towed So whether it's the M2 or the 240 Bravo or even the M249, so the SAW. Okay, but no, we're not talking about remote weapon station. We are talking a guy up top of the flex mount yep. with a big grin on his face. It's solely for like self-defense versus being an assault go like the Bradley or the tank. Okay. Well, let's go to the side of the vehicle and check the track. <laughs> okay, so at the side of the vehicle, my favorite part, the running gear. Why has it become a meme at this point? All right, so I'm looking at, it's like three quarters of an inch of armor plate, and I see bolts and holes, so I'm going to assume that this is for the whole length of the side. That's correct. And this is much thicker up here. You're talking nearly two inches of armor here. Is it a steel or composite, or are you allowed to say? Steel, I think. Okay, uh, the track is, it looks like, you know, wedge bolts and connectors, nothing particularly unusual, replaceable rubber. Is this basically the same track as currently fielded on the uh, on Bradley's? Yes, I believe so. And the same wheels and running gear and all that sort of good stuff. So we're looking at the standard three pairs per uh, uh, correction, six pairs per side on torsion bars with shock absorbers on one, two, three, and six. Sprocket is, of course, in front, nothing unusual. I mean, it's, if you've seen a Bradley without the tracks, that's, uh, without the side squares, that's what this looks like. Um, track 
tension. Why do we do that either at the back? <laughs> we'll come back to that in a sec. Right, so the driver's hatch is, looks like a torsion bar holding it up there, just to make it a little bit easier to lift. Another of these wire guards, and stowage sticking out the side. Does this fold in for uh, train movement or anything? This, this as, as it is back here, this is narrow enough for to go on the yes, European, it, European it should, and yep. so on. Okay. And lots of bolt holes and bolts. So this this implies this is all easily replaceable. It should, yeah, it can come off and then as well as to receive additional armor. So react if you think reactive tiles, it's your next level of armor. So once you add all the all. If you put this in the heaviest possible configuration, how heavy is it? That's when you get up to around your 40 tons, because that's the full combat weight. So that's all your added armor, and then all your BII, and then your crew and equipment with it. And these are the white squares are? They're not part of the vehicle. They were um, used by GVSC as they were doing some of their Oh, for testing purposes? So we'll just go over your camera net or something. Stowage. Just general stowage? Okay. And okay, I'm curious. You got those rubber mappings. Any ideas? So your queen antenna that you have, it's the big um, large antenna mass that you dismount from the vehicle and it can stand way up. And we just have it configured where you can it can be hold, held on the outside of the vehicle. Oh I see. So you got a clamp up here. So yep. you, you don't have to, okay, that's the way you're going. So you have the base antenna and then it goes up to be able to be stored on the vehicle and then you can easily remove it to put it in, the, to set it up so you can use it to transmit over further distances. Is it designed to be able to accept things like APS or boomerangs? So we haven't looked at any of the active protection system specifically for Amphi yet. Oh. Again, we better expect it not to be in the bottom line. Yes, right now at least. I did quickly mention it, but just to show you where you tension the track on a modern vehicle like Bradley, you insert a grease gun onto this Zerf fitting here, pump away, it'll extend by pressure the idler wheel outwards, and when it reaches the correct level of tension, a relief valve will pop uh, out, will come a bunch of grease. Okay, you gotta clean it up, but it's easy, you know you're done. Okay, the back of the vehicle, first thing I see, vehicle lifting weight 80,000 pounds, so I guess that gives us the top end limit. Now, compared to a Bradley, this seems to come out a heck of a lot more than I'd be used to. I mean, the, the door's familiar. Yep. Oh, you blanked off the fireman ports. <laughs> Boo, hiss. Uh, but you, why do we have all this stuff out here? So, on either side, you have your fuel tanks. The fuel tank, fuel tank. And then this is another uh, carrying rack. So, all your sick ups for the command post, or all the, uh, so like your, for all your various staff sections, that's where it's all stored is in the, bustle up above. Well, why do the fuel tanks need to be so big and up? Is it just simply so you can go further or have you moved it from outside where they were previously? It's moved, they were moved outside from where they were previously. So Bradley has a different fuel system design and then than ours because of where we move the fuel system, the fuel tanks outside of the vehicle. And this just make it bigger inside? A little bit. Okay. And I'm looking at, oh, I guess your tow, tow cable still goes here. Um, Ethernet. So that gives us the remote out capability. It is Ethernet. Yep. So all of the various uh, systems that would be used inside the mission command, again, varying depending on your staff section for how the inside is configured. So they can, as they set up an actual main command post. So like back to back in a set of four or something. Yep. Or set up all their tents, then they have the ability to. So if you think like your AFATAS, and you can plug your AFATAS in through that panel and then go into the tent. So then you'll have your more collaborative staff section within the overall command post that's set up. So for the curious, AFATADS is the artillery direction computer system program thing that I don't understand, but he, under he understands, he's a redneck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stand clear around if that makes sense. Um, I don't know, it strikes me as just being a lot longer than I'm used to. I, I guess your drivers haven't run into anything by accident because they're an extra three feet behind, no? Not yet, no. All right. A ladder? Yep. Access up. Is there a roof hatch? There's, yep, there's an escape hatch on the roof. 
So in, in event of fire, at the top, through the hatch, drop the ram, and the driver has his own hatch. Yep. Does, That's it, does it still have a hell hole to get to and from the driver's position? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's not a very spacious pathway, but... <laughs> well, that's always called the hell. Uh, I haven't seen anything particularly unusual. Uh, reversing camera. I haven't seen one. We do not have one. Um, haven't we fitted on that one yet? No. Nope. Planned? Eventually. Oh, so I'm looking at a lot of bizarre looking at attachments over there. What are they? So this is an early version of the mission command. So it was our, during our engineering manufacturing development phase. So this is... One that was initially designed to hold like your rucksacks for the soldiers, but the user community didn't like the design, so that was removed from the actual production vehicle. Because the rucksacks can't get knocked off? Uh, it's kind of a bulky and cumbersome design. So. But does, I mean, so I, I do see the stowage bins way at the top, and not massively easy to grab, but I mean, I'm used to, I need some tool for my tank. I go to the sponsor bin, I lift up the sponsor bin, and there are the tools. Where do you keep the BII on this? A lot of it's kept internal inside the vehicle. And how long, I, I, I presume the speed is exactly the same as about the same amount of time for PMCS, nothing unusual. A lot of the required maintenance hours that were, are for the Bradley were um, made as requirements for the EMP, so they could have a lot of that same similarity. So you have a, less of a delta between your Bradley mechanic that would also be working on the EMV. For training aspects. Same MOS? Basically. Yep. Same MOS. Do you need an ASI for it? Uh, not right now. They haven't talked about ASIs for differences. So the vehicles that are currently testing in Stewart, they're being recovered by 88s, I presume? Yes. Self recovery or uh, M88 is used. Okay. I'm going to assume that's uh, an APU or something up there. So that was a cooling system. Ooh, developed. <laughs> You wish. <laughs> so it was specific to the Army's the Win-T, so the, one of the network initiatives that was a few years ago that has been um, paused and set aside. So now that's been removed from the production vehicle. And then so the space claim that was inside the vehicle for that additional network suite right now is just open shelving that the, the soldiers can use for stowage. So is there a car? Only on your medical variants. So on the, the back where we had the rack where the tents uh, would go, they have a big environmental control system across for the, that sits in that same space claim to for specifically for cooling for the patient's care inside the vehicle. So that's just your medical evac and your medical treatment vehicles. How about a Russian heater? There was one, and then the user community uh, said they didn't need it, so it was removed from the vehicle. User community. The, the, the little square thing looks like a boating vessel. They used to heat your water. <laughs> The user community said they don't. User community, you are wrong. <laughs> Reverse that. I use my bottle on the tank. Is it the bottle? Okay. We'll, we'll see you if other vehicles. You can just add water and prop it up against a rock like the instructions. Well, yeah, but you can't do that to, to have water, uh, coffee. Yeah. I mean, that's the important thing about the ration here is that you can also use it to boil the water from your coffee. And this is a command vehicle. Yes. You need coffee. We do have um, 120 volt plugs on the inside of the vehicle, so, so if, you have to bring your if you're in a dire stretch, you could plug your silver bullet in and make all the coffee you wanted, or your Keurig. It wasn't designed for that. I'm going to have to have a chat with whoever writes the requirements for these things. Really? Oh, no harm. <laughs> what do they um, okay, so again, we can't see the seats inside, but can you describe the seats for the crews? Uh, I mean, I, are we talking suspended seats? Are we talking four-point harnesses? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the seats can fold up, so you can get a little bit of space between the workstation and the seat itself. But when they're down, it's a harness and then specifically designed foot rests as well. So that way you're protected from underbody blasts. So the blast doesn't actually get up into the soldier. It's, um, goes through the seats and the, the footrest to protect for force protection. And they're designed to be worn with body armor? Yes. Okay, so that's another gripe of mine. Alright, so coming further back, okay, big exhaust. I presume it does the usual Bradley. Hey, I'm over here, big plume of exhaust. Uh, radiators and, well, I guess then the next thing to do is to talk about the engine. Okay, and lastly, the powertrain. Come all full circle. So you say it's a Cummins. What have we got under here? The uh, Cummins engine, so the same engine as the, the Bradley and the Paladin. 
So zero to 30 time is slow? A few seconds. Okay. Automatic transmission, I presume, uh, yep. same, same gearing ratio is probably nothing unusual there either. Correct. And the fuel tank is, uh, how do you fill it then? The tank's at the back. You fill them at the back? You fill them at the back from the top. Okay. Anything worth noting in the top that I should know about? Other than, so we pointed out all the antennas and then the commander's cupola. So for like a mission command variant, that's the, the main aspects to the roof. Um, if you were talking like the mortar carrier, then you'd have your actual hatch that opens up, so then you'd be able to put the mortar uh, system into service. Uh, the TC, I presume if you're driving like the TC, is just using his PBS 14. Yep. Yeah, and that's why I said the driver seat's a lot better than he does. Correct. Okay, so the last thing then we'll just talk a little bit about some of the antennae. I see one, two, three standard look like whip antennas and big mass antenna. So what, what sort of, you said there are four radios? So there's four Stingars radios in the mission command, but then, so we have the big mass in the back, that'd be for um, the antenna for the jamming system. So for the Iraq, if you think about all the crew dukes that were okay, used in Iraq, counter ID okay. systems. And then also on the, so as we're looking right now, the back right for my perspective is where the, on top there, the HF antenna mount is for the vehicle as well. HF, so it's not a Singer's radio? That is a separate radio. So it's the, like the Harris 117 Gulf is a version that uses the HF frequency. So again, it allows you to broadcast over a much greater distance. And then you can also transmit um, data over a HF antenna as well. So the uh, like fill artillery guys, they can use HF to send digital, if they can send fire missions over HF. So we're less relying on the satellite constellation, is that it? No, it's still ground, ground based, just further distance, uh, different wavelength. For navigation, is that GPS or do you have uh, an internal navigation system as well? So uh, GPS. GPS. So bring out the old, uh, the old map and odometer reading then, if uh, the satellite gets shot down. It's sort of interesting looking at the old tanks that had inertial navigation systems. They went to for the Sherman system. Right, I think I have one other thing to talk about on the exterior of the vehicle. Um, again, this is a testing agency. One of the conditions my comment here was I'm not allowed to film inside it. I'm sorry. I know we all want to look like what, what, a, what a, uh, a turretless Bradley looks like inside. I can't show you. And that is, I'm afraid, going to be a bit of a running theme. But, uh, okay, right. Uh, anything else you want to say about the vehicle? Nope. Oh, have, have you driven it yourself? I have not driven it yet. You're the project manager. Show me you get the driver. Just focused on when we were getting it through our initial operational test and then some of our um, key decisions that will be coming up. That's been the, the main focus and then trying to get so that we can get to our first unit equipped at the beginning of 2023. The AMP-V. And it's going to have an m suit designator as well, right? Yes. Yes. Do we know what they are? Uh, the so there's M one two eight five or eight four eight five eight six eight seven eight eight and I think eight nine for all the, the variants. So and they're all the they're all in sequence. Yes, makes it kind of nice. Versus the M one one three where they all jumped around. Yeah, well the the, the home beam was as bad. <laughs> right. Well, in that case, Lieutenant Colonel Costa, thank you very much. I appreciate the tour. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.